Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Preparis, and I'm flying solo today besides my special guest. But before we get to that, a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Dry Robe. So if you were at OCR World Championships or World's Toughest Mudder and you saw people in those long, oversized coats, those are Dry Robes, and they are awesome. Uh, They're the world's most advanced changing robe. I use mine for cold races, like I just had it on at the Abominable Snowman, a snow race, um, I use it for you know post race at things like World's Toughest Mudder, OCR World Championships, and then when I'm not using it there, I keep it at home on my couch for a blanket. And then the other re- thing that's awesome about it is again it's a it's a portable changing robe, so I actually carry them to summer races, and it allows me to change in the festival area without having to go like try to cram into a porta potty and and change there. You can also get it customized with logos and your name on them. Uh, so check out Dry Robe. Uh, awesome product made by some awesome people. Today's episode is actually a special. It's a bonus episode. So this does not count against the way we normally do things. Um, on the line, I have Marco Bedard, the Northman again. Marco, say hi. Hey, how's it going? Awesome. And I wanted to... P- we're recording this the night before the opening ceremonies of the Winter Olympics. What we wanted to do was basically give a kind of behind-the-scenes look from an athlete perspective of what the Winter Olympics is like from the only person I know who's actually been to the Winter Olympics and is also an OCR athlete. So, um, again, Marco, excited to have you on. Uh, give everyone a quick rundown on the Olympics you went to and kind of how that went for you, and then we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, I tried to go to the three Olympics, I guess, and uh, the one I went was... Uh, in Vancouver, in my own country, so uh, I was actually in Calhan Valley, which is uh, two and a half hours out of uh, Vancouver in the mountains. Um, that was uh, obviously a great experience uh, all uh, all around, but um, really that was, uh, like I said uh, many times, like a cherry on a big cake. So uh, it was a really great experience, but the whole the whole cake, the whole thing is is the what's make it, makes it spe- so special. So yeah. Cool. So, you know, you, you can watch the Olympics on TV and, you know, you, you see all the, the action and all, you know, all this stuff. But w- what we kind of want to focus on for this podcast is kind of the behind the scenes um, of, the, of the athlete's experience at the Olympics. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Some of them you may know the answer to, some of them you may not. Um, so let's kind of just start off with, you know, I. I think when I initially think of Olympic athletes, I picture kind of like the scene from Rocky IV where Ivan Drago is in this like very sophisticated training facility and he's out there working out with the best equipment. He's got the best trainers and you know the best nutritionists and all this stuff. What is it really like, right? Do you have, you know, as, as an Olympic athlete, either at, on the way, you know, trying to make it to the Olympics or after you were selected for the team, did you have like a robust robust support structure or is it more like kind of how it is in OCR with kind of everyone's on their own yeah no actually uh there's a there's a really big uh it depends on the country I guess uh and the sport um every every country has their own uh favorite sports if we can say like that and their own uh, budgets for things um but I'd say for the the minimal part of it because biathlon in Canada was not very big. It was actually uh, really small in terms of uh, getting uh, money out of uh, out of the government. Um, so uh, basically, they even at the lowest level uh, of uh, finances, um, it, it's still really, really well uh, supported in a way that we have uh, uh, doctors and uh, nutritionists and massage therapists and physiotherapists and all these guys that are they're not like necessarily uh, working for us directly on like only but they're they're uh they're all services we uh we get and they're they're all people who follow us uh through like uh many many years um during the training towards the olympics so 
at the very moment where you show some, you know, uh, potential, uh, usually as a junior athlete or um, like early senior years. So uh, after 18, like after or before, depending, uh, normally you're going to get on a on a squad, um, and then they're they're going to take you on from there and um, just put you on a on a on a a little bit of a bigger team and then the the more the the bigger team you get like from provincial to uh national to you know international then the more finances the more um people are going to be surrounding you to really make uh like take the best out of whatever you can do so um this might sound sound weird like that but it's it's actually and we don't feel like it once like when we're in the wheel but really, when you think about it, you think back of it. Um, there's there's so many things. There's so many little you know things around around you that make make you uh, really a, a better athlete. That um, it's uh, it's pretty impressive uh, how many people want like the same thing, and even in small sports. So um, so yeah, like the, I think the Rocky movie was a little bit of a uh, <laughs> extreme in a way, like it's a Hollywood style, but uh, some of the things, I mean, they do. Obviously, the 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 doping they do in that movie is probably a little bit not <laughs> right, like, right, uh, classic, right. But uh, yeah, like the the uh, we do a lot of lab stuff in a way that you know we get on that treadmill with uh, all those uh, uh, things on on our like checking on our heart rate or whatever, and uh, so to test every once in a while like our physical abilities, but. Uh, so we do feel like like that a little bit every now and then, but most of the time is actually more like what what Rocky was doing. So more out of our own, and when we're not in a training camp with the national team, we're doing our our stuff and we're just uh, following a, a plan like a, a national plan, but on our on our uh, on our side of the country. So a little bit of both, I guess. <laughs> cool. Now when you're I'd say when you're selected for the Olympic team, do they bring everyone together for like a training camp or is it still everyone's training on their own and then you just come together for the actual, the big event? No, no, you do, uh, you do a lot of training camps with uh, the national team and it's actually depending on the sport again, but uh, for uh, our part uh, and I think most endurance sport, uh, you don't really get to the Olympics like, uh, you know, not long ago. Like you, you really make your way towards the Olympics like, two, three, four years in advance and you show up some progress and you show that you're, because there's really a limited amount of people who can go and it's actually not based on whoever is the best in only the country but in the world. So uh, usually in m- most sports, if, you, uh, if you're the second best athlete in your country but your country is not good, like they're, they're in the last countries, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter who... Who you're beating really in your country, you need to be still doing a qualification on the international level. So uh, from from that point, you you still need to do race races on the highest uh, highest level in the years prior. In biathlon, it was uh, anything two years prior was counting towards the qualification of the Olympics. So it really does start like 24 months before the actual um, event, and uh, every every um result that you 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 do is going to count towards who's going to get qualified but obviously the closer the, you are to the uh the event uh, the more chance you'll get to be the one picked so uh if you do like you, you're a tenth on a world cup uh 2 years before and uh like the month before uh, uh, another guy gets like 15th at a world cup and you haven't done anything better than that like obviously it's the, the the guy that's stronger at that time of the year, but it still does count. Like uh, every single race you do. So and we do a lot of you know races and training camps together. We do train on our side of the country for biathlon. It was east and west usually, but we we sh- we show up together every now and then and and do lots of tests tests and and to figure out where we are against the other guys in the country in around North America or in the, in the in Europe, and then from then we go back home and work on whatever we need to work. So it's a, yeah, it's a it's a pretty big uh, big wheel to to roll in. Cool. So if you're selected for one of these, you know, one of these programs that 
is earmarking you as you know a possible Olympic uh, contender. So you know you're two or three years out. Is the is the government or is it the like a biathlon, like a Canadian bi- biathlon association that's you know, are they paying for your gear and, you know, provide like more like dual sponsors type stuff? Uh, it's a little bit of both, I guess. Um, once you're, uh, as soon as you're um, targeted as a potential athlete, so that could be uh, in our sport, it can it can be as early as like 14, 15 years old. Um, the federation is going gonna, is gonna to see whatever you're doing if you win a whatever a big race for your age or something. And the, the, the different governments, so the like provincial government up to the national um, government are gonna, they have programs to help athletes uh, progress throughout their, their younger career. And then there, there's different level from there uh, that you, you can get some kind of, uh, um, like uh, some money to, to really either help your, uh, your uh, coach. Uh, so that he can give you uh, better uh, uh, training or better time, more time, whatever, or really help you directly to go do a race or a training camp or something like that, or at a, like all those different levels are are, are just gonna bring you uh, more opportunities. Usually, it's still an amateur sport. Like biathlon is really amateur sport, so um, there's really not a lot of people actually making money. But the more you climb up in the ranks, the more money you'll get to uh, do those uh, training, like important training camps or or important races that you need to do to, in order to get a, a good result, in order to get to a bigger race, and etc. So it's um, it's yeah, like at, at some some levels, um, the federation is uh, is um, um, there. They have a, a budget from the government. Um, so, uh, and then they manage their own budget uh, and then they have sponsors that, that sponsor the federation itself and in all sport for gear and all that stuff, uh, it's all personal. So the, the federation does not, uh, provide the actual gear except for, uh, the, 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 the clothing so that we're, we're all, uh, uh, you know, Imagine. putting the same national team clothes, uh, but for skis and, and boots and guns and, all the rest, uh, it's uh, usually up to us. But some, you know, some federations, some countries, some sports, they have they have uh, deals with companies directly. So uh, as soon as you're on a national team, you'll get like this and that, or whatever. And I guess that's kind of that for us too, but only for uh, for really good showing for uh, for uh, clothing. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of everything. And then uh, once you get in that super small margin in our sport in our sport there was really like uh six to ten spots where you you actually got a, a direct um uh salary if you can say like that like it's actually um the um, uh the same as wealth fair is that yeah, so uh, st- sure. stipend yeah it's so basically it's a monetary stipend to take care of your yeah, personal yeah. stuff yeah yeah so and yeah and but that money is really just uh enough to to pay for food and and your whatever you wherever you're staying <laughs> you're and, like scraping uh, by yeah so you still pay for your travels uh which is always weird uh you still pay for to go to world cups to represent your country which is always pretty frustrating but um but at the end you always you know it's probably better i'm happy i went through this because it's, it's i didn't make a lot of money uh doing that sport so in a way you, you, like the the ones doing it are doing it for passion like for because they love it so it's not really uh professional in a way but um but yeah once you get there it's it's still better because you actually uh you're not losing money so that's a that's a big step from uh the years before where you were you were really like always losing money and just trying to you know get to that level so cool yeah i think that that clears up a lot because i think again you know we see you know maybe for like the summer Olympics, you know, there's basketball players who are making millions of dollars and then they, they come together, form a team and they play for a little bit and then they go back. Right. And they have all this, they have all this support and they have all this money. And, um, on top of that, some of them have sponsors on top of that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, but really the Olympics is, uh, mostly, you know, most of the sports are for amateurs. So it's, um, what people think, because you're at the Olympics, you're you're like a super athlete, and they put you in the same categories, you know, football players or 
hockey players or all those professional sports, which is not the case for probably 90% of the sports that are at the Olympics. And actually, these Olympics, um, for in Canada, hockey is, is the biggest, you know, lucrative sport. And for the first time in, in, in the, the recent, I guess, era of the Olympics, um, hockey will be uh, amateur. So, uh, oh, the, really? The profes- yeah, the professionals are not... Uh, going to be at the Olympics, so that's a that's a first thing, and that's the first time they do that, and uh, that's going to change the game quite a bit, and it's going to make things um, quite interesting in a way, just because you know it, it was like you said, those all those professional guys making millions, they have contracts, and they like some of them get to go, some of them don't from the contract, and then they just get together, they play, they win a medal, whatever, and then they go. You know, they go back home. Some of them, I'm sure, are, are super happy, and it's part of the the dream. But they're still not in the same really, um, you know, life category in a way as as the other athlete. But you know, in a way, it's 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 uh, it was interesting uh, in Vancouver um, to meet some of the you know biggest stars in my country, uh, hockey players, uh, in person, and and they were actually um, you know like they knew. Um, it didn't seem like they were over anyone else, and they they it definitely showed that they they had respect for everyone around them because they, I guess probably they knew that you know they're making millions and all those people around them are working just as much as them if not more, and they're you know like <laughs> they have in trouble just to pay the rent. So, um, but it, it was kind of cool to you know to have them go to us and talk to us and you know be like i'm not a big fan of hockey but like big enough that you know i know how, how big that is and um but yeah so that's it's uh you, the people who actually make like big a lot of money you'll know it because they win everything and they have all those big sponsors but pretty much everyone else is just there like i was you know like um just for the passion of it and uh, you know they some of them make some money but it's not it's not like a career where you can do that for four years as either like except for super big exception so yeah it's a it's interesting uh mix of people that go to olympics <laughs> so i know pre nine pre sometime in the 90s it was amateur only and if you were a professional you couldn't compete in the olympics now you okay. you said that the amateurs are competing again this year is that a canadian decision or was that an olympic decision no that's the olympic uh, decision uh and that's uh I know it's really uh, uh, controversial because uh, it's it's not really you know professional can't go because it's not because uh, that that would be a fine line where you know what what is a professional and and all that stuff but it's more um, towards uh, N- uh, NHL and um, uh, the Russian um, Federation yep. or something like that so so there's a lot of you know professional guys who are in a way professional but it's they're not as big in a way like i don't know like in in european countries or like you know czech republic or where there's actually big federations of hockey um that are going to be allowed to play but uh, you know if you're in the nhl you can't so it's it's more federation uh boycott or i don't know how to call it and i'm not super uh super um um you know uh i, I haven't read the whole report i just actually yeah kind of learned it on on the spot but um but yeah i don't know so it's i know it's going more towards that towards amateur um than professional but i will see more uh once the the game starts i guess yeah i'll definitely definitely be paying attention and looking into that uh, once the game starts so speaking of that so the opening ceremony did you go to the opening ceremony when you went to the olympics no, no, I, w- I went to the, the closing, but uh, I wasn't there for the opening. My race was too far, and the federation didn't let me go, so that's a, that's a bummer, but at the same time, it's, it's for the be- better uh, for, uh, for uh, my performances. That's crazy. I, I, so was, my next question was going to be, does everyone march, and then what determines kind of who's out there marching and who's not? So. Yeah, uh, no, basically it's... Um, I think it's a little bit of both like a personal and, and a federation choice. It, it depends when you race and, and all that stuff, but it's a, it's actually a big, a really big process. Uh, it's like the security involved into that and 
all the different uh, things you have to go through and all the waiting and it's uh, hours and hours of be like before you you actually get in because everything needs to be you know uh, perfect for the, the organization so usually you know you you won't really uh, see the, the the big athlete that are racing in the next few days after the opening um, so, uh, and biathlon was one of them, um, like the first races on the first day and, uh, the, the, their last biathlon races on the, the very, like all the, not the last day, but the day before. Uh, so those races all, all, uh, all the, during the two weeks. So it's one of those sports where, uh, that could make a big difference if you start fatigued right away off the, off the start. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a big show. It's kind of, you know, if you wanted to do the biggest, two weeks of your life and you would go to a, to a rock show, like right before your, your, uh, your two week starts. Like it, in a way it doesn't really make sense to go. Um, so I was, you know, I was a little bit bummed about it, but at the same time, it's, it's part of the game and you're not there for that. You're there for, for competing. And, and once your races are done, then you, you definitely can uh, enjoy. But, um, the, the sports like that, there's so many events that you can't really, uh, enjoy it too much some sports they race the first couple of days and then just one one race and then they're done so they stay there for a couple of weeks and they have fun but um it's uh usually endurance sport and it's not really the case yeah not, i mean now that we talk about it it makes a lot of sense because i mean marching that many people in an organized fashion you know by country has got to be a disaster right you got to be they must be standing yeah. for hours going into that yeah, going into yeah. what you see on TV, and you know, I've been a part of fairly large movement, like division change of command type stuff for the military, and you know, yeah. it's just like it looks nice to an outside observer, but to like the guys, I think the Olympics would be different, but to the guys standing in like a, a change of command type thing, it's it's usually pretty awful. We're usually pretty people are pretty upset, yeah. and uh, you know, having to compete in a event the next day would be not the best taper, yeah. so. No, no, exactly, and and I mean, uh, everyone is allowed to go to the closing, and the closing is the big show usually. And uh, but I I I was I was extremely happy to see that as uh, uh, at least because uh, you see it on TV and you're like yeah whatever like it's uh, you know we won't go like you know in advance like for for years it's it's clear that biathlon is not going to the to the opening anyways. Um, but um but then the closing like was. What do you see there, or I guess it's the same for the opening. It's a, it's, it's pretty impressive. So that's a, that's a part of the, the whole experience for sure. Cool. So obviously Olympics, huge deal, once every four years. You know, can you talk to us a little bit about the your pre-event nerves and kind of what you know what maybe you do to keep, to keep those calm? Because I know I have a lot of nerves just going into something like World's Toughest Mudder, which occurs every year, and I get to. You know, if, if I have a bad year, I get to go back in the next year versus, yeah. you know, a once, which could be, a, you know, a once in a lifetime event for some people. Um, can you just talk about how you dealt with that and what that's like? Yeah, um, that's uh, actually that that was a little bit smoother than uh, than I um, anticipated, I guess. Um, you know, like coming for uh, from years and years and years of doing the same thing, um, it's uh once you get there, like you think it's going to be, you're going to, you know, uh, it's your pants or whatever, but it's, it's just like another race. Like it's just a, and, and as I think, um, I had the opportunity to do actually like bigger races in a way, like with more people, with more spectators, um, in Europe. Um, and you know, the biggest races in Viathlon have over 40,000 people like, uh, on the race, like on the, it's like the whole, uh, ski course is filled with layers and layers of people and uh, it's so it's so uh, heavy it's so impressive that after that once you've seen those races and uh, in Eastern Europe is the same it's it's kind of you know it takes the nerves down on whatever else you're gonna do and once you're on on you know it's stressful like the days before but at the same time there's so many things uh, to see there's so many people, there's so many sports, there's so many things happening, uh, so much, you know, all the security going to the events and back and just, just going to your training, like going breakfast in the morning, then you go to your training. It's so complicated. It, it just like takes all your, um, your attention 
everywhere else, which is actually dangerous because you want to concentrate on, on competing. But at the same time, it it's it feels like it takes the nerves down just because you're not focusing exactly on what you're going to do uh, because there's all those things happening. So, like, you, you you don't even think about it and, and you're already there. Like, you're on the starting line and you're, you're like, wow, it, there's, like, it's already – it's already the moment to, to race, and, and once you're there, it's uh, it's automatic. Uh, it's really – I have a funny story um, that I, I had a concussion once in a race, uh, uh, in a, like at the early – in a, the first – the second lap of a five-lap race, is race and uh, and I, I, I lost uh, consciousness during the race. And I still did a full lap, four kilometers, in like 27 minutes, which is usually like – five or uh, seven minutes, but uh, I did a full lap. I shot five rounds without being conscious, like being, <laughs> I, I have no memories of that. And I had a panic attack after that when, when the, it came back because it came back to me right where I, where I lost it. So it's a, it's a weird story, but at the same time, it shows how when you've done something for thousands and thousands of times, it just becomes, become, you know, um, yeah, robotic. Like it's automatic. So uh, as soon as the gun starts, you know, you start and you don't even realize your race is done and you've done, you've done the, an Olympic race. And it it was not different than another race. You know, like it's uh, it's really the same exact thing. And I think that whole thing, the whole team prepares you for that as well. And you know, going to all those big races, the like the World Cup circuit and all that. It's it's uh it prepares you for the best and and uh after that it's just you know it's just candy all all of that olympic stuff is you know layers and layers of we say in french we say butter like it it's it's it makes it bigger than than it is like everything is big but once you race it's a it's a race like in just in any other race and i think ocr is the same like whatever whatever you, race you do like whatever level whatever country once you you start I mean, it's there's different obstacles and all that, so that changes. But it's still a race. You still give your best. You still know how to run. You still ought to know how to this, this and that. So uh, it all becomes automatic, and that's uh yeah, it's impressive to see. But um, cool, good, yep. an- <laughs> good answer. Um, so you know, with you being a biathlete, I'm sure that's going to spur some interest in the bi- biathlon over the next couple of days from some of our listeners. So. Give us a rundown of you know what biathlon consists of you know how how far is the distance uh, if there's different types of events and then kind of you know the breakdown of what happens when you miss and you shoot when you shoot and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, biathlon is actually um, a pretty cool sport and I'm sure uh, most of uh, the listeners are American and uh, I think it's a really in a way American sport. Uh, Europeans love it. Um, American like the ones who know it they love it, but it's a uh, it's a really unknown sport in North America, um, but um, it's a, it's basically skiing, cross country skiing, in the technique of skating we call. So there's two techniques for cross country skiing. It's like in the tracks where you keep your feet together and it's like walking a little bit, and there's the one that you're like speed skating uh, with poles basically, and that's the technique we take for that sport. So that sport is really only about skate skiing with a rifle in your back. It's a 22 caliber uh, rifle, but it's it's not your average, you know. Uh, I, I was about to say Canadian Tire, but Walmart or you know, uh, random two hundred dollar rifle. It's really a, a really really uh, fine tuned um, biathlon rifle. It's made for that, and it's made for for uh, competing in in high or super low temperature. Um, the 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 rifle itself is a piece of work, really. It's uh, and it's uh, worth a, a lot of money for for a 22 caliber. Um, but uh, it's it's part of what makes it so special because cross country skiing, as uh, not many very people know, is one of the hardest um, physical sport um, in all the sports. And then you combine it to a completely different sport where it's it's not physical at all. It's really uh, like about 80% mental um, and the rest is technical. So it sport with the shooting. So, um, so for those who have hunted or, uh, you know, uh, been in army or 
you know, been in a situation where your heart rate is pumping and you need to, to, to you know, think quick and, and shoot something or, or do something, like, uh, really, really specific, really precise, uh, you kind of know what it is. It's that kind of feeling, but in a competitive um, thing. So, so yeah, for so there's, like, uh, I think now there's seven distances. Um, they added one uh, since... Uh, to, like I think two years ago, um, there's, so there's two relays in teams, team events. So one is for for two person, uh, a male and a female. Um, there's a, a four men or four women team. So that's I guess there's three team events, and there's one two men and two women. So yeah, there's three three team events, um, and the other ones are individual events. It's a mainly an individual sport. You cannot help yourself or you know you don't follow yourself you you really do a single race yourself and then you, you give a relay um uh, tag if it's in a team race um so the main team race is uh is the uh, same sex uh, for male or for females uh first male goes uh does uh, three laps like he does all his race which is 7.5 kilometers and then he gives the tag to the, the second uh skier and then four, uh, third and fourth and the first team to finish is the, the first fourth person who finished the race. For the team events, if you miss a target, so you have two sets of uh, targets, uh, five targets every time to hit, and uh, you have extra bullets. Um, you, so you have three extra bullets every time, so you really, really have eight bullets to, to hit five targets. Um, so that changes the game a lot for team races because people are shooting a lot faster. And that can be interesting to see. And then if they still do miss after those eight bullets, then they have to do uh, penalties. Um, and then um, all the individual events, there's the longest one is 20 kilometers for for uh, uh, shooting. And the shortest is uh, 10 kilometers. Um, so there's uh, 10, 12.5, 15, and 20 for males. And uh, around the same a little bit less for, for females. Um, the shortest distance is a sprint, uh, two shootings. So you shoot once uh, prone, which is uh, uh, laying down on the carpet, um, shooting at the little, uh, um, in Canada, it's easy. It's, uh, the, the, the target is as big as a, a loony, so uh, a toonie, so uh, $2, which is uh, uh, about an inch and a half diameter. Um, so probably it's like really a, small. Probably like a silver dollar for Americans. Maybe. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't know. But, uh, yeah, it's about an inch and a half. Um, wide, uh, you'll see at the Olympics, I guess they're probably going to explain that. Uh, and you shoot at, uh, 50 meters, 150 feet without, uh, any kind of type of, uh, uh, scope. So, uh, there's just that hole you look into and that little round dot you look at the target in. So nothing helps you basically. So that makes it extremely hard because that, that you really need to align for those those three little round um, circles to, to hit the target once you're tired. And if, the, if it's windy, you need to adjust yourself and, and all that. So, so yeah, and then you should standing as well, two, two positions. And, uh, yeah, there's all those bunch of races. But really the team races and uh, the, what they call the mass start are the, the two, uh, like, more fun to watch. Um, the pursuit pursuit is fun to watch as well. You start after – you know the time you had from the sprint, so yeah, it's um, it's a little bit complicated, but at, at the end, it's really you, you ski loops and you shoot, up. and then if you miss, you do penalties. If you don't, you go ahead and, and get get away, uh, away from the others. So uh, it's a, it's also of of a fun and uh, yeah, you should look into it. The Americans are are doing amazing this, these last few years as well. So are the Canadians. Um, so it's uh, it's fun to watch and cheer cheer for your countries, but the big countries are yeah that that's a sport where the really big countries are professionals as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that answer that's a long answer with lots of info, but uh, yeah, you, you should look into it. That that's easier that way, I think. <laughs> now that, that's pretty good. So Google is telling me that a silver dollar is an inch in diameter, so basically one okay. and a, one and a half times the silver dollar, and the yeah, pretty much. The fifty cent coin with uh, the one with John F. Kennedy on it that I had a couple growing up uh, that I haven't seen in years is one point two inches. So maybe okay. 
That's the one's a little bit closer. Yeah, um, yeah. So for the for the sprint courses and then the the you know the twenty k, how long does you know how long is a how long is it taking for the I want to say average, yeah. but uh, um, the first uh, the first guys are gonna do it's really close. Like uh, those races are super close from each other. Um, I was uh, once I was seventeenth, uh, uh, um, and I was I think thirteen seconds from the st- from the first guy. Jeez. Uh, so th- these races are really really close and. The best guys for a sprint, which is 10 kilometers and two shootings, uh, are going to do it around, you know, 22 minutes, um, including everything. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, you know, the top 30 guys are all going to be within like a minute or two usually. And, uh, and then the longer distances, uh, like uh, the individual uh, 20 kilometers is going to be around 50 minutes. Um, so, uh, and uh, the penalties for the, the that distance only, like the individual they call the really long distance, is like the classic one that that used to be the military biathlon and all that, and they kind of kept it with minutes of penalty with uh, instead of uh, loops. So if you do miss a target, you get a, a an extra minute right away on your on your uh, on your clock. So you don't need to you know ski in a, a, a little bit of a like a little loop. But you you get a, an extra minute, which is like a lot more than a, a loop. Which uh, when you miss, usually you do a, a 150 meter uh, penalty loop, which is I guess like 400 feet, 350 feet. Um, so it's it takes 20 22 seconds to do one loop, and uh, so for that event you you get a minute, a full minute. So you usually shoot a little bit sh- slower, and especially yeah, you have 20 targets to shoot down. Uh, it can it can go uh, can go down pretty fast in the in the the uh, results. So um, and usually the best guys are they're gonna always shoot uh, on average at around ninety percent, uh, like on a season on a full season. Um, so uh, so obviously to perform, unless you're like a, one of the top skiers, you need to shoot you know always ninety ninety percent up and uh, up to hundred percent and yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, that answered another one of my questions. So you mentioned it a little bit at the at, at the beginning when we started talking about biathlon, but these rifles are, I mean, they're pretty expensive, right? Like, what's what would be the a beginner level entry cost for one of these rifles? Uh, at- level entry is, um, I think uh, there's actually there's uh, two companies. Uh, there's a few more, I guess, uh, but there's two big companies that have um, kind of a monopoly. It's a, a Russian company uh, called Ismash. Uh, it's the same company that that, that used to do the uh, AK-47, I guess. Um, and those those rifles are, are the cheapest ones, and I think you can get in Canadians about twelve hundred bucks. Uh, so probably around a thousand dollars, you can get a, a entry level um, uh, biathlon rifle. Which is a really low quality, I'd say, but um, but still, like usually the clubs, little like local clubs, they they have a bunch of those, and uh, it's pretty rare that someone starts by Applin and, and buys a rifle. They usually go to a club and and they sign up, and then they can kind of rent it, um, and they do that for a few years before they actually buy a rifle, and, uh, and but then after that, if you you know. If you want a little bit of a better quality, uh, you go with a, it's a German company called Entrus, and they, uh, they have probably 95% of the, of the World Cup market, so the, the big athletes are all with the same, the same, uh, uh, basic rifle, and then they modify it, uh, and this rifle would be more around $2,500. Um, so, like, from, from the, from the factory, but after that, it's, uh, you don't see a lot of athlete on the World Cup with, a a stock rifle, so you can uh, you can play with it quite a bit. There's there's laws, uh, rules to follow, I guess, but the, the, there's still a lot of things you can do and uh, change and you know make it you know better and uh, like play, put well, play with the weight is the the main thing. You have a, a, a minimum of 3.5 kilo to to, uh, to 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 keep, and then there's there's a minimum uh, pressure you have to keep on your uh, on your uh, trigger, uh, oh. yeah. So that was me. My next question: What's the trigger pressure? The minimum? Uh, I should know that, but I can't remember. Oh, okay, <laughs> it's been too long. Yeah, uh, but it's not extremely like it's uh, usually like uh, hunters or 
they are uh, they are they always um, uh, they shoot uh, uh, like their trigger is is heavier than ours. So the the minimum is actually I think in memory I think it's like 50 grams or something. But I could be wrong. Like I I've done it a, like a hundreds of, hundreds of times at every single race. Like they test it. Um, and if you're like under, you need to to crank it up a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, I can't remember. Sorry. I know I've shot I've shot some like competition type rifles, and they have triggers of like a pound or a half pound, where it's like you almost breathe on okay. it and it goes off. And then I know I for like so. the military or and what like kind of most I think normal rifles use is more like a nine to ten pound trigger. So it's like oh, okay. you know, it's 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 heavy. Like you need to. Like when you yeah. pull the trigger, you, you you need to pull the trigger. Yeah, but uh, no, it's definitely not that. It I said fifty, but it's definitely not fifty. It's probably uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll find it on yeah. We can cut you know, I'll find it somewhere. <laughs> I'm I'm googling it right now. Let's see what uh, let's see if I can yeah. pull something up real quick. Uh, the trigger pull must be greater than one point one pounds, which is five hundred oh, grams. Five hundred grams. Okay, yeah. No, that's yeah. like. That's still really light, like. Yeah, no, that's what that's what I said. Like usually, people uh, the couple times I went for for hunting or whatever with even good rifle, I was I was like, wow, this is this is a heavy. Uh, uh, but it's still like biathlon is still a uh, accurate, uh, like a precision sport, so it it couldn't be like super heavy as well. But um, for yeah, for yeah, it's I don't know, it's maybe too light, but it's uh, it's the the rule that, uh, there is. So the everyone's putting it right away like five ten or something, so that they they're okay. But uh, they're still like they don't need to to push. They don't need to use muscles at all anywhere to to shoot. Right. Yeah, I thought it might be a little bit heavier because you're carrying it around on your back and it's being jostled. But I mean, it's not like you're carrying it loaded, right? Like you stop, no, no, put no, it right yeah. around in, you know, yeah. shove the bolt forward and then literally touch the trigger for those for those of you who never shot a 1.1 pound trigger it's like it's literally like touching the trigger and it'll yeah, it'll shoot yeah. yeah for you know and once once you shot a uh like over a hundred thousand rounds i guess you you think it's you always feel it's heavy <laughs> that's what's funny about it <laughs> like you're so used to it because it's it's mechanical like it's not a uh you know there's nothing automatic you really uh mechanically pull off the tr- the 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 oh, in English um like the, the, the mechanism to to take the bullet off and then you push it back in so it's 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 all mechanic movement and once you're on it you you don't feel it light you really uh you wish it was lighter because you get <laughs> you get so much feeling on your on your uh like your your brain uh, to finger um uh, the reaction from your brain to your to your eyes to your finger is gets like really really sharp so uh you just want you know like nothing in the way and if you could shoot with your eyes you would do it (laughs) yeah cool so uh a couple more questions and we'll wrap this up so if an ocr athlete wanted to get into you know winter olympic type sports not necessarily competing at the highest level just something to do you know as an additional wintertime hobby you know is there any sport you would recommend over yeah, but, uh, obviously uh, skiing uh, does lots of uh, of friends. I guess uh, we'll see how is, there's lots of people like that don't have really access to uh, to snow or or ice that much. But um, for uh, anyone that that does, um, I mean, I've been skiing all my life and. I, I, I'm so impressed to see the, that many OCR people that you know don't really come from sports or whatever, and they've done OCR, and then we became friend, friends, and then they end up buying skis. And uh, we have so many friends that never skied before, and they've been skiing for a few years, and now you know they're trying races and all that. Um, it's a it's a wonderful sport, and it's actually uh we we've been asked a lot like when when we were really doing well in o c r uh like what do you do to you know different to make that make you uh that makes you good and uh lots of people didn't understand that we didn't run much like we really didn't run much and we, we were skiing roll skiing in the summer and skiing on snow in the winter and just show up at races and still we were doing really really good. Um, and I think that a, a big part of it is because it's so soft on your body. 
it's so hard physically, but it's so soft, like on your joints and and uh, like it's not a impact sport. So like like running and trail running and OCR even worse. Um, so I think it's a it's a great way to to keep a really high uh, level shape and change. You know, it change your your mindset as well. Uh, when you, especially if you have to learn it, and then uh, when you're trying to to train in it, or uh, uh, it's it's not going to hurt you, and it it really does make you better. So, whether like keep keeping running 12 months a year is is a lot of repetition on on your joints and on your on your body. It's it's taking a toll on yourself and you know, even in your head because you're you're doing that that same thing every every uh, every day and every like you know step so um so i think it's good to to get out of your comfort zone and and uh, try different sports but um it's a yeah skiing is fairly easy for those who have uh skiing uh, area in their in their uh uh like skiing clubs or um places they can rent skis and stuff um but you know there's always uh, uh snowshoe running which is actually gaining lots of popularity and for runners it's uh it's uh it's pretty simple you just need to get snowshoes, and they make you, you make your tracks, and after that you just keep keep running in your in your tracks and uh, to to, uh, to to take the snow down, and uh, it's a it's another really fun way to run in the woods uh, without any you know there's not anything in your way. You just run whatever you want, and between the trees you don't need a, tra- a trail, so that's an interesting way to to train in the winter as well, and we do lots of that for sure. So yeah, that'd be two. Uh, I guess that's mostly not at the Olympics, but um, skiing is. So I would definitely say skiing. Yeah, I've never done. I've never done cross country skiing. Obviously, I've done. I've done plenty of. I won't say obviously, but I've done plenty of downhill skiing. Uh, yeah. Growing yeah. up, and I had. I did get to do snowshoeing last year. Well, no, I'm sorry. It's three years ago now in Lebanon, and it was pretty awesome. Just kind of we were just kind of hiking around the middle of the mountains. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's definitely fun. And if you if you've downhill skied, uh, another one that's not in the Olympics, but uh, uh, ski mo uh, ski monitoring is uh, is an amazing sport as well. Like uh, it's a little bit like a mix between cross uh, um, uh, trail running and uh, cross country skiing and alpine skiing. So you you go up with skins and take your skins off, and you go down, and uh, there's 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 big big events uh, all around the all around Canada and even in the U.S. Uh, on the West Coast and East Coast. There's a bunch of races. That's uh, that's super fun to super fun sport as well and extremely extremely hard on your body. Uh, not a, a, in the impact form, but again like skiing uh, in the in the physical uh, part. So that's uh, that's another great sport. Yeah, the closest I've come to cross country skiing is. I remember being with my parent, my dad at the bottom, and my sister at the bottom of like a ski mountain, and like you're too far away from the chairlift, so you gotta like skate ski yeah, yeah, to yeah. get to it. <laughs> and I remember, I remember like only going like a hundred yards, and then being like, "That was terrible. Yeah. Like, why would you cross country <laughs> ski? What a terrible sport." <laughs> but you know, I think the, the same though. I think the same. If I go for downhill skiing and I need to ski from like one part to, to the other like the equipment is not made for that but once you once you try it you know like both my skis and my boots are lighter than your just only one of your boots basically and that's ah. and that's the truth like it's a like a whole a full kit of cross country skiing at like a the top level i guess is about a kilo um so uh or two kilos i guess the two boots and two skis so it's uh, it's super light you don't you don't even feel it so yeah, <laughs> and my my only my only experience with biathlon is playing the Atari twenty six hundred uh, biath winter sports. It was oh, a yeah. winter Olympics video game. Have you played that? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Uh, there's there's a bunch of games. Uh, like you, most of them are in German because the Germans are so uh, into biathlon. But there's a bunch of like actually recent games uh, where you can you can play biathlon. But it's yeah it's. Uh, pretty fun. It, it's a pretty for those of you listening. It's a pretty basic game. Like I think you move the joystick left and right to like skate ski, and yeah. then the shooting part was basically like a black square on the middle of the screen, and then like a dot would go up and down, and you got to press the button when the when it's in the middle. <laughs> yeah, when it's in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So, Almost all right, like cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, uh, so last question, Olympic specific. I've heard that people let loose after, at least for the Summer Olympics, I'm assuming it's the same for the winter, that people let loose after their event's over, right? Because they've been training yeah, and preparing yeah. and so focused for four years that, like, it turns into, like, worse than a college party. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I've and, in, the, in the Summer Olympics <laughs> as well. But, you know, you're not asking the right guy because uh, basically by F1 we raised um, – the last, like, like uh, Vancouver was was uh, finishing on the twenty third, I think, and the twenty second was our our, uh, our last race. Um, so y- your last race is basically the end of the Olympics. So you you do let loose, but at the same time you finish the Olympics, and then two weeks later you're on the World Cup again. So uh, so yeah, but we're I think we were a different animal than anyone else because everyone else was all like. Ah, uh, season's over, party, and you know, like uh, they didn't they didn't care, and they they played all those games and they did <laughs> those parties and whatever. But uh, at the Olympics, yes, a little bit, but mostly uh, mostly after, because most sports, uh, the Olympics is, is their last event, you know, of the season, and for for a lot of those athletes, it's their last event of their life, maybe. So uh, they really, I think, they really want to, like you said, let loose. And forget about it and just enjoy the moment. Um, but yeah, for for individual sports, uh, endurance sports, or at least biathlon, that's uh, yeah, that's a different uh, that's a different ball game a little bit. But uh, I still got to get to get uh, to to see the the last uh, hockey game in uh, Vancouver, which was uh, which was uh, pretty pretty awesome. So that's that's definitely a high of uh, of my of my career, even though it's not even in biathlon. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's true. That's uh, definitely true. But <laughs> not not in uh, our case. But most most sports for sure. Okay, so before we let you go, do you know when the biathlon is going on this year? Do you know the dates off the top of your head by any chance? Uh, not off my head, but uh, it's usually every two days because um, the males and females are are uh, rarely on the same day. So there's like uh, twelve races total, or even fourteen maybe now. Um, in 14 days, so uh, yeah, like every sometimes two days in a row, but every two days usually there's an event. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really long uh, um, time change uh, there, but it's uh, the races are at night uh, over there, so I think it's gonna be during the day for us North Americans, uh, which could be uh, could be good, but uh, yeah, you should uh, definitely check it out, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's an exciting sport and cross country skiing as well. But I think for for a, a, a looker, for a, a spectator, it's uh, biathlon is is one of the the fun sports uh, to watch. Like it's more theatrical in a way, and uh, there's a lot of changes happening. So, but before you look at it, uh, Google it maybe, or, or try to see. Sometimes before the races, they're going to explain it. Uh, that's that's a good thing to do uh, before, so you, you kind of know what's going on. Uh, for that, and that goes for all the sports because it's it's you know people like. Like football and hockey or whatever, because they know what's going on. But then they they they, they look at a, a bobsled and they're like, ah, ah, that's cool. And then uh, five minutes later, they're bored and they have no idea what's going on. So I think it's a good thing to try to find different sports and know how it works before you you try to understand it, and uh, then you enjoy it a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. I know, you know. I think for the average, similar but different, like the average person watching cycling, it's just a bunch of guys sitting on their bikes. Yeah. you know pedaling in circles but the um there's actually a lot of strategy and a lot of like you know there's a lot of intricacies with you know what jerseys you go for and yeah. drafting and you know teams helping out teams and there's a sprinters team and there's a the team competing for a gc so i think anytime you learn a little bit more about a sport it definitely makes it more enjoyable to watch totally. and i you know i mean i know the basic rules of football but I'm, i don't get into it that much so it, yeah um like i'd rather watch the tour de france than uh football yeah, which yeah same here <laughs> <laughs> probably gonna get a bunch of angry emails for that but it's the way it is um yeah. and then so last question do you have any friends uh that are racing that we should be cheering for yeah yeah i mean uh all the americans and the canadians are uh good friends long-time friends um the canadians i i, I guess uh there's one guy that's still uh, my age in a way uh but uh the other guys are are younger but uh they, they were uh they were racing, uh, uh, you know, when I was uh, finishing my career as well. So 
it's going to be their first Olympics uh, for the Canadian team. Uh, there's only one guy who went before, so that's going to that's be a young team. Uh, and the, the Americans, there's a couple of older guys, a couple of guys that, that could do uh, really well as well. And uh, and then obviously all the all the Europeans. Uh, yeah, we have. It's a it's a small uh, it's a big sport, but it's a small sport like anything else. Like once you're in it and you're at the high level, you're around the same guys all the time, so you get to know uh, a lot of people. But yeah, I think I'm getting old, so there's less and less of the guys that you know I used to race with. But um, uh, there's more and more younger guys. But that's a that's a good thing, I guess. So uh, so yeah, no, just uh, just cheer for your country and uh, and. Give it a you know give it a thumbs up uh, and uh, and if if you, if you get the chance to see some races uh, and understand the sport uh, you'll definitely see that uh, especially Americans and Canadians for those uh, uh, in in those countries that's uh, that's fun because it's a, it's an unknown sport so if if you haven't heard about a biathlon and then you get to learn about it at the Olympics. Uh, then just follow those follow those athletes. They're they're not used to it. They they don't have any attention from anyone. So uh, it's a it's it's always good to have a little bit of a new new people uh, you know learning about the sports and enjoying it. It's a beautiful sport, definitely. So well, that was awesome, uh, Marco. Thanks again for coming on in such short notice. Uh, for those of you listening, I messaged him I think like two days ago, and he's like, I'm in Ecuador. Uh, Hit me back, hit me back in a couple of days, and I was like, "All right, I want to get it out before the Olympics start." So, uh, th- thanks for the last minute. No problem. And thanks for sharing all that insight. Definitely cool and definitely unique. Come from someone who's actually been there and done that. Um, any final shout outs or plugs you want to give before we take off? Yeah, it's all good. Just uh, looking to uh, Northman if you want a taste of uh, an Olympic uh, level OCR race. <laughs> That's really right. About that, you know. <laughs> And, and if you want to hear more about Northman, go back. Uh, Marco was just on like it was like two episodes ago, uh, and you can listen to that. And he explains all about his race series and all the other events he has going on. So a lot of cool stuff happening there. And then other than that, um, the Strength and Speed website is now selling bleg mitts. So the gloves created for Ultra OCR, for specifically for things like Spartan Ultra Beast or Toughest Mudder or World's Toughest Mudder, Created by World's Toughest Mudder champion Deanna Blegg. It's basically like a neoprene mitten that has like a slot in the side. And you can take your hands out, do an obstacle, and then put your hands back in. So the gloves are awesome. I've been wearing them for some of my training runs when it's been real cold. And it keeps your hands warm, but also allows you to, you know, kind of open that flap and adjust the temperature and let your hands cool off. So I can't wait to use them for actual OCR uh, for Toughest and World's Toughest. Uh, but yeah, we are the sole distributor of them inside the U.S. So head over to TeamStrengthSpeed.com, head to the online store, and pick yourself up a pair. All right, I think that's it. Marco, thanks again. Thank you. We'll uh, talk to you later. Yep. <laughs>